In this presentation, we'll be talking about growing and storing forages to enhance and extend the grazing season. I'm Heather Darby from the University of Vermont, and I'll be your presenter today. In today's presentation, we'll cover why we need or should be trying to enhance and extend the grazing season, and then we'll also go over different strategies to enhance and extend the quality and yield of your pastures. So let's talk about why we would want to enhance and extend pastures. And probably the most obvious reason is that we need to make sure we're meeting the organic certification standards on our dairy operations. Specifically, you'll probably remember um, in the introductory course that the USDA National Organic Program's access to pasture rule specifies that livestock need to be getting 30% of their dry matter intake for at least 120 days per year from pasture. So in the event that you think that your pastures may not meet this requirement or maybe you don't have enough pasture or land base to meet this requirement, you may consider one of the strategies that we'll outline today. Other reasons for enhancing and extending your pastures are to supplement or increase your herd's dry matter intake. Many farmers are looking to produce more pasture and higher quality pasture to improve overall dry matter intake of their herd. Another reason to enhance and extend the pasture is to address seasonal decreases in pasture productivity. In places such as the Midwest and the Northeast, we often see a pasture decline or productivity decline in the middle of the summer when our cool season pastures go dormant. So using strategies that we'll outline today could help you overcome those natural periods when pasture become less productive. Extending the pasture season can also help you reduce the pressure on stored feed sources. So if you're limited in the amount of stored feed that you're able to harvest on your farm and you really need to extend the pasture season to make sure that you have enough feed to make it through the winter months, then extending the grazing season will be very important for you. We'll talk about several ways to enhance and extend the grazing season on, on organic dairies or dairies in general. And there are several ways that you can go out doing this. Of course, the primary route to improving, enhancing, and extending pasture productivity is to make sure that the soil and overall pasture management meet the needs for growing healthy plants. As an example, in Module 2, we learned about um, maintaining the fertility of your pastures to help make sure that the pastures have the right nutrients that they, that they need to grow and produce high yields. Besides forage fertility or pasture fertility, we also need to make sure that we have proper grazing management of our pastures so that we're not overgrazing the plants, we're allowing them to have adequate rest periods, which then enables the plants to regrow and become more productive over a longer period of time. There are some additional strategies that may be new to, to you or new to farm that also can be implemented to enhance and extend the grazing season. The strategies include stockpiling forages, using supplemental water or irrigation, um, and then also looking toward implementing annual forages into your perennial pasture rotations. So let's start with pasture irrigation. Irrigation is critical in many parts of the United States where water is very limited. However, irrigation may be a new practice in areas that often receive plentiful water, such as the Midwest and the Northeast, but do go through time periods where they have very low precipitation and could potentially benefit from providing water to the pastures. So irrigation, of course, is used to provide water to pastures. And some farmers also use irrigation as a means to actually fertilize their fields. This is called fertigation. And oftentimes we see farmers adding manure or other fertilizers through the irrigation system to be able to supply nutrients to fields. So why should we irrigate? Irrigation can help increase on-farm feed production. It can increase the overall biomass and even quality of feed on the farm. In some cases or some areas of the United States, they receive such low precipitation that it's absolutely necessary to apply water to be able to harvest any crop from a field. In other parts of the United States, supplemental water may actually improve overall yields and quality. Irrigation is also becoming an option for farmers to make it through droughty periods. Over the last couple of years, 
we have seen increasingly longer periods of time without any significant rainfall. And so irrigation can provide security during drought periods. And then using irrigation can also help improve overall water use efficiency, essentially providing plants water when they need it. Let's briefly talk about different types of irrigation. In general, there's two common types of irrigation, flood and sprinkler irrigation. Flood irrigation has many pros and cons and is probably most common in the western part of the United States where irrigation is essential to crop production. The pros of flood irrigation are low labor, low equipment costs, low maintenance. It's probably one of the least technical systems that we have available to us to supply water um, to crops. The downsides of flood irrigation is that it requires um, very uniform fields and in many um, cases require land leveling. It's often considered um, inefficient in terms of, of water use and it may also cause actual water logging of the soil because essentially you're flooding soil with water all at once. It can also lead to significant nutrient leaching again because you're saturating the soil all at one time. Other types of um, irrigation systems include pivots, pivot systems, and linear systems. Again, the, the pros of these are low labor. They do more efficiently use water compared to flood irrigation and you can control the application rates much better than in a flood irrigation system. The downside of pivots and linear irrigation is that they're very capital expensive, very expensive to set up and often are set up in areas where there's low natural precipitation or very well drained sandy soils where the investment can be paid back very quickly. We also need a very large pump and a very, very high water volume, which can limit the system in some areas. And of course, it may also have very high maintenance costs. We also have solid set sprinkler systems, as you can see in the photo here. The pros of this is that they're highly automated. You can set a timer and essentially set when they'll come off and on. And for the most part, they're a pretty low labor system that's available. Cons of solid set sprinklers. There is some moderate amount of maintenance that has to be done on solid set sprinklers. The initial investment in the equipment can be a downside to many farmers because there's a significant investment basically in the installation because it is solid set. A very popular system is portable reel system. They can be automated on a timer. And the investment is often lower than the other systems that we've talked about, but can still be quite significant for some farms. They do require a moderate amount of maintenance. And again, just getting the set up, uh, the time and installation can be a downside for many farmers. The last system that we'll talk about is a portable pod system or inline irrigation system. These are becoming more popular in the United States because they have many benefits. They have really good um, application rates that are somewhat easy to control. They're easy to um, install on very flexible terrain. Um, you can have cows out grazing when these are operating. They're very grazing tolerant. They have kind of moderate to low initial infrastructure costs and they're pretty easy to maintain. The cons, of course, to a portable pod system is that Sometimes they require a high amount of labor because you're constantly moving the pods on a daily basis. So they're portable, they have to be moved um, in order to cover the entire field with water. It's easy to justify irrigation in parts of the country where there's very, very low precipitation. And again, you need to irrigate crops in order to get any crops. But in places like the Midwest or the Northeast, portable irrigation pods are becoming popular where irrigation is not very common. We do see some irrigation in the Northeast on very droughty soil, so those that are primarily sand. But for the most part, there's very, very little irrigation on cool season pastures on dairy farms. However, this is changing and systems that are low cost and relatively low maintenance and, and easy to move around such as the portable irrigation pods are starting to be adopted by farmers in these regions. There are several reasons for that. Again, uh, especially on organic dairy farms, some farms are land limited looking for ways to increase pasture productivity. So they want to make sure that if the pastures need water, they have water available. During summer slump, if there's not enough water, and adding water would make the pasture more productive, and they want the ability to do that. 
In addition, we're starting to see longer periods of time without precipitation in the Northeast that are relatively unpredictable. Sometimes we have months, weeks in the fall or in the early spring without water. And so having the ability to add water to those pastures would increase productivity. So there has been some research done to evaluate pasture productivity with portable irrigation pods. And this is some research that was conducted in Vermont on an organic dairy farm. And you can see that the patterns were irrigated in July, August, and September. And you can see days between grazing cycles for non-irrigated land versus irrigated land or irrigated pasture. And then you can see the yield increase of the pasture from irrigation. So when the pastures were irrigated, you can see that the, the regrowth was a bit faster in July, uh, faster in August and then faster in September as well. And you'd see the yield increase from irrigation also increased, you know, during the summer months, approximately 30%. Now, the interesting piece here is that dry conditions in the month of September, virtually no rain, um, led to poor regrowth of pastures on this farm. And this farm actually ran out of pasture in the non-irrigated parts of the farm because there was no regrowth. And because he had irrigation, he was actually able to have pasture into September. So in that case, the yield increase was quite significant. And having that irrigation uh, meant the difference between pulling the cows off the pasture or keeping them on the pasture for another month. So there's lots of considerations that should be made before you go out and purchase a, an irrigation system. Of course, the cost per acre is really important. Is this going to make sense on your farm? Why are you considering irrigation in the first place? Sometimes farms that are located at higher elevations, they tend to have less dry periods and some of our farms maybe down in the valley. So does it make sense? Do you have some subduction? Do you have dry period that your pastures can't overcome? So thinking about that and then the cost per acre, can you afford to install a system? And then where are you going to get the water from? Irrigating pastures, irrigating anything takes a substantial amount of water. So you need to have an adequate water source. You have to be able to supply the overall capacity of the pump and, and the irrigation system that you have. So that's a significant consideration. Again, the equipment requirements, you know, making sure you uh, size the pump correctly and that for the type of system that you have, are you able to install it and then maintain and operating it? Um, and of course, the timing of irrigating and, and installing irrigation systems is also very important. Okay, so irrigation is one strategy that farmers are using to improve pasture productivity during some slumps, during droughty periods, and sometimes just because they don't receive adequate rainfall in the regions that they grow in. Now, another strategy that farmers are uh, quickly adopting to increase pasture productivity is the production of annual forages for pasture and for store feed. So why would we consider planting annuals, especially when perennial forages are the predominant source of pasture and feed on our dairy farms? Many um, annual crops are drought tolerant or cold tolerant. Our cool season perennial grasses are not at all drought tolerant and they also don't like hot weather. So having a forage that's growing that can tolerate drought and can tolerate hot weather will improve pasture productivity overall. We also have the ability to have very cold tolerant pasture species as well. We would also consider growing annual to fill gaps and feeds. So again, the summer slump that we talked about. Um, and also at either end of the grazing season, where we have low perennial pasture productivity. Sometimes annuals produce much more biomass per acre than our cool season perennial forages, and that can increase the amount of grazing and dry matter intake that's available to a farm. And then a nice thing about many of these annuals is that they can actually serve many purposes on farm. You can plant them to graze. If you're not able to graze all the forage, you can also harvest it for stored feed, or you can also harvest many of these animals for grain and seed. So once you have them in the ground, there's lots of options for utilizing them on your farm. So again, in the Northeast, we see this summer slump period here, which are cool season perennial forages. And you can see this um, happens between June and August in most years. And this slump in productivity is a great opportunity to plant a warm season annual crop that likes these conditions and can produce high amounts of biomass, 
during periods when our cool season perennial forages are not producing much biomass at all. So that's an opportunity to improve productivity. Here's just an example of that data was taken from Farm Vermont. You can see the pasture yields in June, declining in July and August, going back up a bit in September and October, but never reaching the productivity level of June. So again, here's an opportunity to grow a summer annual to increase pasture productivity. Now there's lots of annual forages that we can select from. They're great annual feed and forages. So we have cool season annuals and those would fit at the ends of the grazing season. So essentially cool season annuals could be grazed prior to grazing our perennial cool season grasses or they could also be grazed at the end of the growing season after our cool season perennials have declined in productivity. And we have warm season annuals that include crops like millet, sorghum sand grass, and even grazing corn. And those, again, would help overcome low pasture productivity in the heat of the summer. Cool season annuals include crops like oats, barley, triticale, spelt, wheat, rye, and brassica crops. These crops can either be planted in the fall or in the early spring of the growing season. Okay. What's really nice is that these crops, um, warm season annuals and the cool season annuals, can be combined into um, a full season grazing system or cropping system that would include grazing cool season annuals early in the spring, transitioning on to perennial forage, and then transitioning back on to warm season annuals, back on to perennial forage, and then ending the grazing season on cool season annuals. So warm season annuals that are very common uh, for forages include sorghum, sedan grass, sorghum, by sedan grass, pearl millet, Japanese millet, teff, and corn. Sorghum is a crop that's generally grown as a one-cut system. It doesn't have the best regrowth potential. So it's likely not the best choice for, um, for a grazing system where you want to have this crop regrow a number of times so that you can utilize the annual more than once. The Dan grass is probably um, one of the most common and popular um, pasture annuals that are used in our region. The Sudan grass has good regrowth potential. It has finer stems and is a bit leafier and a, and a little easier for the cow to handle. Essentially, it sort of mimics more the perennial cool season grasses that they're used to raising. The sorghum bisidum grass um, is also very popular, but they tend to have thicker stems tend to be leafy but not quite as leafy as the sedan grass and their regrowth potential is not quite as high as sedan grass. Then these three categories, the sorghum sedan grass and sorghum by sedan grass, there are BMR varieties that are available around mid-rib varieties that are approved for organic use and these varieties have higher digestibility of the fiber and generally you see improved dry matter intake when we have higher forage digestibility or fiber digestibility. Okay, millet is, is also a very popular summer annual that's used on dairy farms throughout the country. It's wonderful crop to graze. It has very small stems, lots of leafy biomass. It's very soft and palatable to the animals that are grazing it. Its regrowth potential is very good. Um, it seems to tolerate a broader range of soil cushions than the sudan grass and sorghum sudan grass crosses. So essentially, millet seems to tolerate wetter. Um, and slightly cooler soil conditions than the other crops that we've talked about so far. Teff and grazing corn are other summer annuals. I would say they're more, more popular as harvested feed than for grazing. For summer annuals, to, to generalize uh, the agronomic of these crops, they really should be planted when the soils are at 60 to 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. In our region in the northeast, these are generally planted really anywhere from the end of May to early part of July. Seeing with a grain drill works the best because you get the most uniform stand establishment and growth. And any of our farms actually delay planting until after they've taken their first cutting of their perennial forage. These crops should be roughly planted to about an inch deep, um, especially for sorghum and the sedan grass and the sorghum by sedan grass, planted to a rate of 35 to 55 pounds per acre. The millet and teff should be planted a bit shallower and at much lower seeding rates. Many of our farms will plant successional plantings for pasture because these crops do continue to grow and they will grow very quickly in the heat of the summer. Um, and oftentimes the, the growth exceeds what cows can utilize and they end up wasting much of the feed that's out there. 
And though many farms are doing successional plantings so that the cows can better utilize the feed. Fertility is an important consideration with these crops, especially with the sorghum and Sudan grass. They have very high nitrogen requirements, very similar to corn or very intense hay crop, often requiring, especially if you're grazing multiple times or harvesting for stored feed, 100, 100 150 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. Manure applications uh, should be followed before planting and usually after each cutting or grazing, if at all possible, to keep up um, the productivity. Okay, and this, this is an example of how much fertility a BMR sedan grass uses. This is a first grazing of the sedan grass. You can see the protein here is at 23% and it yielded about um, 1,300 pounds of dry matter. By the second graze, the yield goes down, as you might expect, but so doesn't the protein because the nitrogen needs of the crop aren't being met just from applying animal manure through grazing, and then by the third graze, the yield goes down a bit more, but then you can see the protein is very low, and this plant is nitrogen stressed. So this sedan grass, sorghum sedan grass, does need a considerable amount of nitrogen. Okay, now harvest options, all of the summer annuals can be harvested for stored feed, and they can also be grazed. When you're grazing the sedan grass and sorghum sedan grass in particular, you need to make sure that you're grazing at height that are, are really about at the three foot um, tall, 36 inches in height stage because of the proof acid issues associated with grazing sand grass. And then once you graze, you want to make sure that you graze down to only about six inches. Um, you don't want to graze off the crown of the plant or the growing point of the plant. Many of our farmers, again, will graze multiple times and are actually clipping after each grazing to have a more uniform regrowth. Here's some photos of cows grazing the BMR sedan grass, and again, you can see in the photo to the right, these cows are grazing the sedan grass. For the first time, you can see how green it is. It's very healthy. And then to the left here, this is um, a second or third regrowth of the sedan grass, and you see how it's much less green. It's a little bit nitrogen stressed, and it doesn't have the same quality or as high quality as first grading. So again, fertility management is very important with this crop. And here are some cows grazing millet. And just lastly to emphasize that these crops have multiple uses, multiple purposes. And in the case of warm season annuals, these crops can be great or they can be harvested for stored feed. And you can see the yields that can be generated from this crop. I matter yields of um, close to 9,000 pounds per acre. This is across two cuttings. And, um, and then you can see the millet, sorghum, and sedan grass as well. Let's talk a bit about utilizing cool season annuals for pasture and forage. Here's an example of a cool season annual cropping system that's being utilized on organic dairy farms in Vermont. So trickale is seeded alone on fields that are being renovated in late summer. So essentially a rundown perennial pasture or hay field. It's plowed under and then triticale is seeded in early mid-August. And then it's allowed to grow. And then in the early spring, triticale can be raised prior to reseeding. Um, and reseeding generally takes place at the end of April or early May. So this can allow farmers to get some really early feed, get the cows out of the barn, get them a pasture if the weather cooperates. However, the worst case scenario is that you had a green manure and a cover crop growing all winter and you can plow that under and add some organic matter and recycle some nutrients back into the soil. So if it worked out, it um, has a a reasonable amount of dry matter for early feed, excellent quality, and very palatable for the animals that are grazing. Okay. Here's another example of a cool season annual cropping system. And again, this cropping system could follow a uh, sedan grass or warm season annual, or again, it could be a plowed under perennial field that's going to be renovated. So in this example, oats and winter triticale are planted in the late summer, so middle of August. Same as planting just a triticale, except you're using higher seeding rates of 150 pounds per acre. So you're including two species in this, in this mix. Uh, the two crops are being planted, one for fall grazing and one for spring grazing. So the oats will be grazed off in the fall, and the triticale essentially left there to grow and be grazed the following spring. So grazing the oats in the fall, it's planted in August. It's usually grazed the very first part. October. 
This produces really high quality and palatable feed, and farms have reported that of all mixes they've used cows seem to milk best off from this set of annuals. Okay, and then the same rotation occur the next spring where the cows um, graze the particularly in the spring, and then you can prepare the field in the spring or early summer to reseed or plant your summer annual. Here's an example of some data collected in Vermont of grazed triticale. So this is the grazed portion of the triticale, which produced about 1,300 pounds of dry matter, food protein of about 20%, and digestible NDF of 70.6, and the net energy lactation in mega cows is 0.71. It's a very high quality feed. Now, the really nice thing about um, grazing winter cereal pastures is that you can often get the cows out of the barn earlier. So here's winter cereal pasture, first grazing. Um, in this example, there was about 900 pounds of dry matter yield. And when you compare this to the cool season pasture, the first graze from the cool season pasture, you can see it's similar and often a bit higher. So the dry matter yields from winter pasture can be higher for winter cereal pasture. And they also are ready for grazing about two weeks and sometimes three weeks before perennial pasture is ready to graze. And again, here's a picture of cows grazing triticale in the early spring. Now, cool season annuals can also be used for stored feed, and they can produce significant amount of dry matter yield depending on when they're harvested, um, and they can also produce um, a decent quality feed as well. So if you're not able to graze the triticale or other winter cereal that you have growing because of the weather, and you need to let that stay in the field, then you can go in and harvest that forage in the boot stage or even the soft dough stage and produce two, three tons of dry matter per acre. So it can also serve as a store feed. The last annual crop I'll talk about is fall seeded brassicas. Brassicas are a very high quality feed source for med grazing animals, very high in digestible energy, protein and, and other uh, minerals and nutrients, so they're very popular. They grow very well in the um, cool season and end of the season. In the Northeast and the Midwest, um, brassica really need to be seeded in the late summer so that they can get established and, and produce some growth for late fall grazing. Seeding rates really do range, but I kind of average approximately five pounds per acre. And if they're seeded in mid-August, Usually a month to a month and a half, depending on precipitation and heat, there'll be about 10 inches of growth for grazing. Most of the time, farmers wait until October when the perennial cool season pasture has climbed to graze these crops. But there is a potential to have multiple grazings if managed properly. Here's some pictures of various forage brassicas. You can see there's turnips, there's kales, and there's mustards and some that bulb and others that do not. So there's a wide variety of fridge brassicas available. Again, it's really important to consider plan date. You want to get enough dry matter, enough biomass, make it worthwhile for the cattle to actually go out there and graze. And you can see here, this is data from four different years, cross-planted mid-August to the first week of September. And of course, crops that are planted, again, by mid-summer, yield the most biomass, the protein is always um, quite high, but the dry matter yields of this crop are, are highest when planted in the midsummer. So just to wrap this up, I think it's important to realize that these annuals can be grown as part of a cropping system that can fit into a perennial rotation as well when we're trying to reseed field, reinvigorate perennial forage stands. It gives us the ability to rotate, reseed, and to oftentimes maybe reinvigorate the soils um, in those perennial stands. So rotations can be diverse. You, you have the ability to take a first and sometimes a second cut of perennial forage crop and then plant a warm season annual, graze the warm season annual or harvest it for feed. You can leave that warm season annual residue on the soil to cover the soil in the winter and reseed the field in early spring. You also have the opportunity here to seed in oats and triticale once the sedan grass is finished. Here's a picture of a farm that has multiple species in their rotation from sedan grass to grazing corn, having field ready to be seeded to oats and triticale in the late summer. 
So summer annuals have lots of benefits on organic dairy from helping to diversify crop rotations, strengthen perennial forage stands, overcome low productivity times during the grazing season, and also protect farmers during long periods of drought and sometimes erratic weather. They can also create um, high biomass stored feed for farms that may be limited in, in the land base that they have and need to produce maximum yields per acre. Just to wrap up this presentation that's focused on extending, enhancing, and really maintaining the productivity of our pastures, it's important to understand that there's a multitude of tools available to organic dairy farms to enhance pasture productivity and help them meet the required access to pasture rule to make sure they're able to supply the herd with nutrients and dry matter intake that it needs, that the farm's able to address seasonal decreases in pasture productivity, and also help them improve stored feed needs on their farm. And finally, on many farmers' minds are climate fluctuations and climate uncertainty. Implementing the strategies that we've talked about throughout this course, better grazing practices, maintaining fertility, building soil health and structure, and then also incorporating other tools such as irrigation and diversified crops can help us build resiliency on our farm to overcome issues associated with climate.